In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your Spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and the word you claim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. And we praise you for the gift of water that sustains life. And above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you.
Let us pray together. Beloved and sovereign God, through the death and resurrection of your Son, bring us into your kingdom of justice and mercy. By your Spirit, give us your wisdom that we may treasure the life that comes from Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading is from 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 5 through 12. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give to you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness and righteousness and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. Although I am only a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil, for who can govern this great your people? It pleased the Lord to, it pleased the Lord that Solomon had to ask this. God said to him, Because you have asked this, and not asked for yourself long life or riches, or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. I indeed, indeed I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. second reading is from Romans chapter 8 verses 26 through 39. These words celebrate the death of God's actions for us through Christ's death for us and the activity of the Spirit praying for us. We are fused to God's love poured out in Jesus Christ. Nothing, not even death itself, is able to separate us from such incredible divine love. The Spirit helps us in the weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very spirit intercedes with the sights too deep for words. And God who searches the heart knows what is in mind of the, the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good. For those who love God, we are who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be confirmed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn within the large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. 
and those whom he called he also justified and those whom he justified he also glorified what then are we to say about these things if god is for us who is against us he who did not withhold his son but gave him up for all of us we he not with him also gives us everything else who will bring any charge against God's re elect. It is God who justifies, who is condemned. It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed in, in, interdeeds for us, who will separate us from Jesus Christ. Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, or pearl, or sword, as it is written. For your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all of these things, we are more than conscious to him who loved us. For I am convicted that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh. According to Matthew, glory to you, O Lord. Throughout Matthew's gospel, Jesus and his disciples proclaim the good news that the kingdom of heaven is near. Here, Jesus offers several brief parables that explore the implications of this announcement for people's lives. Jesus put before the crowds another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which when someone found and hid, then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, Yes. And he said to them, Therefore every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is old and what is new. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
This weekend, we are celebrating with four of our young people here at Trinity as they affirm the covenant that God made with them in baptism. Grayson Davala, Aaron, who we know as A.J. Gerber, Nathan Harding, and Eliza Holmes have all participated these past two years with me in our program of instruction. They've attended classes, gone on retreats with other congregations, whitewater rafted on the famed Middle Yakahaney River in Pennsylvania, and they wrote and discussed a paper about their faith and how it relates to this rite of confirmation. And as we so often say, more. A part of that more was a trip last year to the Amish and Her Mennonite Heritage Center in Holmes County. Now the heart of that center is a mural that is painted in the round that depicts the rise of the Anabaptist tradition from the Reformation to the present. And the message of the mural is often depicted in the stories of individuals who have been prominent, prominent in that Anabaptist tradition. Two of them stand out of my memory. One was a, well, colorful character out of Ohio's Amish tradition known as Jacob the White. He was a figure from the 19th century who came to believe that Jesus was going to return very soon. His reading of the revelation of John and the description there of the martyrs around the throne of God being dressed all in white led him to the conclusion that in heaven we would only wear white garments. And so he ordered his family to only wear white so they could practice what their lives would be like in heaven. I am going to take a wild guess and think that he was not the person who did the laundry on their 19th century Ohio farm. Another conclusion reached by Jacob the White was the exact day that Jesus would return. But more than the day, he also claimed that he had discovered where on the earth Jesus would return to. It would not be in Jerusalem, as most millennialists might teach, but rather in Holmes County, Ohio. And taking again from the book of Revelation, the image that the Lord would be seated upon a throne Jacob took it upon himself to build a sturdy chair out of good Ohio hardwood. And he carried that chair with him on the back of a mule whenever he traveled around Holmes County. So that if the day of the Lord's return would be off, whenever it would happen, Jacob would have his throne ready for the Lord of the universe to actually sit upon. We saw that chair, the very one, there on display at the Heritage Center, loaned to them by Jacob's descendants. It remains unsat upon, at least by any recently turned Messiah. But there was another character depicted in the mural a 17th century Dutchman and proponent of the Anabaptist tradition. Now, in Holland at the time, the Reformed Church was the dominant Reformation tradition, and they had declared the Anabaptist tradition to be heretical and ordered that any proponents of this her heresy be arrested, tried, and executed. The figure from the mural, and I forget his name, he learned that there was an officer of the law with a warrant for his arrest on the way to the house that was providing him shelter. So he ran off and was chased by that lawman. 
Now, the Anabaptist was said to be a man of slight frame. And so in his attempt to escape, he dashed across a frozen canal. His pursuer kept coming after him, and he was not of slight frame. And he proved too heavy for the ice, broke through, and could not extricate himself. Now, our Anabaptist saw his predicament, which, of course, provided him the perfect opportunity to escape capture. But he didn't. He returned to the canal and he pulled his pursuer to safety, saving his life and immediately being placed under arrest. He was asked by his now captor why he came back. Didn't he know that he could have escaped and saved himself? He replied, I, I do want to live, but there is a higher call, and that is to love my neighbor who is in need. And when you broke through the ice, you became my neighbor in need. So I had no choice but to give you aid. He was martyred for his faith, his life-saving actions notwithstanding. Eliza, Nathan, A.J., Grayson. When you confirm your faith this morning, like when I said yes to these same confirmation vows over half a century ago, like when everyone else who is with us today who made those same affirmations at some point in their life, well, we all, in essence, pledged to live our lives as Christian men and women. Put things perhaps a little too simply, but I hope effectively. Every day we will make decisions that in the end will determine if we have been more like Jacob the White or that 17th century martyr depicted in the mural we saw last year. If we don't want a life that others will judge, judge as foolish and even comical, and with it a faith easily dismissed as irrelevant, then we need to have principles by which to live. And the lessons we heard this morning provide us some of that guidance. When Paul wrote his letter to the Christians in Rome, he wanted to introduce himself and the powerful gospel that had charted his life's witness to the truth of God, revealed through the life of death, and resurrection of Jesus. Paul knew that there were other claimants of truth clamoring for the allegiance of the people in his world. And in the last verses of Romans 8, he spoke to those claimants directly. Now, if this were a sporting event of our time, we might call his words trash talk. Not that they are trashy, but they are given like an athlete wanting to get into the head of an opponent. Paul calls out all those others who would claim greatness and power. Some he names as obstacles to our trusting in God. Naming those experiences that argue against God's love for us. Hardship, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or we might say danger or sword, or in our time, violence. Paul also names forces in life that either seek to claim our loyalty or are used to frighten us into seeking shelter in some unsafe harbor. Death or life. Heavenly powers, earthly rulers, things that are, things that will be, powers coming from any quarter, Nothing at all that exists in creation. No power, no entity. You and all of us, of course, have our own experiences that challenge us. We must name those forces in our time that try to pull us away from God. You can swap out your list for Paul's and his trash talk remains just as valid. 
Who can stand against us? No one. Who can bring any charge against us? No one. Who can condemn us? No one. Who can pull us away from the love of God? No one. No one nor anything is powerful enough to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Period. Exclamation point. That is the foundation for the decisions that we need to make as we live this life as Christian men and women. You are loved by God and nothing can change or alter that. When you seek to reflect that love in your own actions, you will make mistakes. You are not perfect and will not exercise perfect judgment at all times. But any error in judgment or any act you make cannot separate you from God's love for you in Christ. The certainty of that love is the foundation of the freedom that is ours to do what is right, even when doing so is difficult or dangerous. Now, sometimes the decisions we make will be very difficult. Sometimes the right thing will not be readily apparent. A part of our need for living this life is reflected in the early years of King Solomon's reign, which we heard about in today's lesson from 1 Kings. Solomon has a conversation with the Lord in a dream. You can think of this as an invitation to be a person of prayer. And I hope you'll recall our discussion during confirmation of the four acts of prayer. The first act is that we talk to God. And the second act is that God listens to us. But it's followed by the third act in which God speaks to us. And that prayer is completed when we practice the fourth act, when we listen to God. In Solomon's prayer, God promises to give him something that he will need in his life as the king of Israel. And remember, this promise was made to him as he was a young man. It is still something that we need today to live as Christians in the 21st century. Solomon was promised understanding to discern what is right. That's at least how the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, the one we read from this morning, translates the promise. But if we could read it more literally in the Hebrew, it would say that he would be given an understanding mind that can hear justice. The fifth vow you will make this morning is to strive for justice and peace in all the world. That's a heady promise. In the paper you wrote, I asked you to reflect on how you would perceive living out this promise the next year in your life, for most of you as a freshman in high school, but in Nathan's case, as an eighth grader completing your middle school experience. I have asked young people of your age to offer these reflections now for over 20 years. And my observation is that this vow, this vow to seek justice and peace in all the world is the most difficult one for someone of your age to see a path for fulfillment. That doesn't surprise me. We know so much now of what is going on in the world, not just our community, but across the globe. And the instances of poverty and warfare, of exploitation and of violence, they are so huge and overwhelming that it just might not seem possible that anything we do can make a difference. Today, let me suggest to you, and indeed to all of us, 
to make Solomon's prayer your own. Lord, give me an understanding mind so that I can hear justice. If you can develop an ear to hear the stories of injustice told by those around you, then in your own place and the position you hold in life, you will at least be able to choose to respond. Christians would make a powerful force if we, as the baptized people of God, each had the ability to hear in the stories of others when justice had been denied and then to respond supportively with understanding. Like the mustard seed in Jesus' parable, such small acts could grow into something great. Now let me finally turn to this string of short parables told by Jesus. Placed as they are at the end of chapter 13 in Matthew, one might make the mistake of thinking that they are the least important of all of his parables just kind of included because there was still space. Such a conclusion would be a mistake. Indeed, these parables are at the heart of Matthew's gospel. And I might argue are the most important part of Jesus' teaching about the nature of the kingdom of heaven. I want you to remember two points of his teaching this morning. In the first two parables that about the mustard seed and then the parable about the yeast. Jesus chooses to employ something very small that can have a transformative influence. Remember now, he is describing what the reign of God is like. Or to say it another way, how our world is changed when the will of God is lived out by those of us who follow it. Jesus could have used something else to describe the nature of the reign of God. Something that might have been made, made more sense to his audience then and now. He could have used symbols of strength and power. He could have spoken of how living out the commands of God would make us winners in life. But he didn't. He chose rather two examples of items so tiny that they might be easily dismissed or overlooked. Yet within their smallness lies the power to transform. What spiritual reality contains such a power as that? It might be dismissed by some, but still able to affect transformation. I would suggest to you that at the heart of such smallness is love. The love shown for us in Christ the love we are called, that we call steadfast and unconditional. The love that does not seek out our own desires, but seeks to address the need of neighbor, even if doing so entails sacrifice. Now I have noticed that in the five vows we use in the rite of confirmation, love is never spoken of. When I address you in a few minutes, I will not ask if you will pledge to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And will you love your neighbor as yourself, even though Jesus himself said that doing those two things would completely fulfill the commands of God. What the five vows that we make actually do is they offer a pathway to keep that great commandment. To give attention in one's living to the five vows of this rite provide a framework for loving God with all one's heart and mind and soul and strength and for loving one's neighbor selflessly and even sacrificially. Such a love for God and neighbor grows out of God's love for us. And that brings me to the final word I want to leave you with today. And I believe it is the most important word that I can share with you now or at any time. 
Two of the other parables in today's list are about the discovery of something of extraordinary value. The first is a treasure hidden in a field, and the other is a pearl of great value. In each case, the one who discovers this item of great value sells everything that he has to possess that thing. Jesus says, that is what the kingdom of heaven is like. I will confess to you that for most of my life I heard these parables interpreted to underscore just how important it is for me to be part of the kingdom. The kingdom is so important that it is worth everything I have in life and that nothing can rank above it. My confession to you is that I always heard this teaching as true but it left me feeling guilty. I knew I had not and perhaps never would be willing to make that trade. All that I have for God's kingdom, which after all has to be taken on faith. But I said some weeks ago that the word parable means to throw something up against something else. And so to see it in a new light. And in more recent years, I've begun to read these two parables in a different way. Not as law dictating something that I must give up. But as gospel depicting something that I have been given. Who is the primary actor in the kingdom of heaven? I would argue that it is God. Who is the primary actor in these parables? Again, I would argue, it is God. So God is the person who discovers the hidden treasure. And God is the merchant who discovers the pearl of great value. And God is the one who is willing to sacrifice anything in order to have such a treasure, such a pearl. That treasure, that pearl, they are you, Nathan, Grayson, Eliza, AJ. You are the one of such great value that God will do anything, sacrifice anything to have a relationship with you. For nothing will keep you from God. And so we are back where we started in Romans 8. Nothing in all creation can separate you from God's love in Christ Jesus. And so when you make your confirmation vows this morning, and when the rest of us in our own hearts renew our promises to live as Christian men and women, we do so in the knowledge that we are not setting out to climb a mountain too high, too steep and challenging to ever reach the summit. But rather that we are stepping out on a journey and that we have already been given the one thing necessary to persevere and succeed. The love of God for us, which is steadfast, sacrificial, and never ending. Be confident in your living as a Christian, for God is on your side. Who in all creation can stand against you? No one.
the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray together. May we who are merely inconvenienced remember those whose lives are at stake. May we who have no risk factors remember those most vulnerable. May we who have the luxury from working at home Remember those who must choose between preserving their health and making their rent. May we who have the flexibility to care for our children when their schools close, remember those who have no options. May we who have to cancel our trips, remember those who have no safe place to go. May we who are losing our margin money in the tumult of the economic market, remember those who have no margin money at all. May we who settle for this quarantine at home, Remember those who have no home. As fear grips our country, let us choose love. During this time when we cannot physically wrap our arms around each other, let us find ways to be the loving embrace of God to our neighbors. Amen. Let us pray. Confident in your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Merciful God, your reign is revealed to us in common things. A mustard shrub, a woman baking bread, a fishing net. Help your church witness to the surprising yet common ways you encounter us in daily life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. When your word is opened, it gives light and understanding. Increase our understanding and awe of your creation. Guide the work of scientists and researchers, treasuring the earth. May we live as grateful and healing caretakers of our home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As the birds of the air nest in the branches of trees, gather your nations into the welcoming shade of your merciful reign. Direct leaders of nations to build trust with each other and walk in the ways of peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your Spirit helps us in our weakness and intercedes for the saints according to your will. Help us when we do not know how to pray. Give comfort to the dying, refuge to the weary, justice for those who are oppressed, and healing to the sick. Especially, Ray and Dorothy, Christine, Pat, Maybeth, Marilyn, Janine, Terry and Mary Lou, Joanne, Marge, Carol, Rosella, Linda, Jeanette, Sandy, and Susan. For all those who are facing eviction and financial hardship in this time of pandemic. Those receiving care from Stephen Ministers and those we now name either silently or aloud. You show steadfast love and direct us to ask of you what we need. Help this congregation ask boldly for what is most needed. Refresh us with new dreams of being your people in this place and time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let your spirit be the guide as our call committee works to find the next pastor for Trinity. Support our synod pa partners, our call committee members, and those pastors who we will eventually meet and consider for ministry among us. Let your love guide us and sustain us in this journey. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We rejoice in the baptismal anniversary of Jason Brewer, Jr., we thank you for your youth in this congregation and community, especially today for our confirmands, Grayson Davala, A.J. Gerber, Nathan Harding, and Eliza Holmes. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In you, our lives are never lost. Strengthen us by our inspiring witness of your people in all times and places. Embolden our witness now and one day. Gather us with all your saints in light. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you, 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Praise and thanks to you, holy God, for by your word you made all things. You spoke light into darkness, called forth beauty from chaos, and brought life into being. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. By your word you call your people, Israel, to tell of your wonderful gifts, freedom from captivity, water on the desert journey, a pathway from exile, wisdom for life with you, for your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. Through Jesus, your word made flesh, you speak to us and call us to witness. Forgiveness through the cross, life to those entombed by death, the way of yourself giving love, for your word of life, O God, we give you thanks. Send your spirit of truth, O God. Rekindle your gifts with us, renew your faith, increase our hope, and deepen our love for the sake of the world in need. Faithful to your word, O God, draw near to all who call you, through Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead them not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord's face shine on you with grace and with mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God. Welcome to worship. The weather has changed our plans for this morning's outdoor service, but it hasn't dampened them. And we are today pleased to celebrate with AJ, Eliza, Grayson, and Nathan as they make their affirmation of baptism this morning. There are several meetings at the church this week for our staff and lay leaders. The music staff will meet tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. The executive committee meets tomorrow evening and they are being joined by the whole council for a brief discussion at 6.30. Our FaceTime group, which is a fellowship opportunity and all are welcome to join us, meets this Tuesday at 10.30 a.m the church campus under the picnic pavilion. All the meetings we have will be held under the pavilion, weather permitting. And participants should bring their own chairs and wear masks. My days in the office this week will be Monday and Tuesday. Appointments are available for those who need to meet with me. Masks and social distancing guidelines will be observed. Appointments can be made via my cell phone or email, and that information is on the website or available through the church office. Have you seen God active in your life? Then consider sharing that for the encouragement of others by submitting a God sighting testimonial for publication in our online newsletter. You can send those to Barb Husty or the church office. Next Sunday, if the weather is better, we will meet outdoors at 10 a.m. in the picnic pavilion, or you can worship in your car via our FM transmitter in the parking lot. As always, an online worship service is available. These are posted on our YouTube channel and available on Saturday evening. If you aren't sure of the YouTube channel address, Contact the church office and we can share that with you. Thank you and God bless.